Well, morning, everyone. Great to be gathered here this morning. Any rugby fans in? John, I set you up then and you were talking. Any rugby fans in? Yes! <laughs> this is one of those weekends when I remind the family that we're half Irish. Um, anyway, uh, the kind of weekend where we, that's what I say to the kids. Um, I hope you've had a good weekend. I hope you have been enjoying the teaching series that we've been on at the moment. We've been working our way through Mark's Gospel um, since the new year. And we've been in a couple of mini-series. And this one's called The Jesus Stuff. Uh, and we're thinking about the different things that Jesus did in his mission while he was on earth. And in the context of blessed to be a blessing. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to read through Mark, I encourage you to, to do so. There's so much uh, richness in this. And last week, if you, if you were here, you'll remember that Adele took us to the end of chapter 6. And we're picking up the story in the middle of chapter 8. And you're obviously thinking, hang on, what about chapter 7 and the first half of chapter 8? Let me say two quick things to that. First thing is we're trying to get to Palm Sunday for the reading for Palm Sunday. So I will say that. Don't make no apologies. We're trying to line things up. But also, we can't go through absolutely everything in detail. What we can do, though, is a chapter and a half catch up in a minute, which I'm going to try and do now. Are you with me? Excellent. So if you, if you move back one page and have open page 1010, let me just catch us up on what has happened just before this reading uh, that takes place today. Okay. Lean in, here we go. Jesus has, is challenging the notion to uh, the Pharisees that what makes you unclean is the fact you touch stuff that's unclean and you don't ceremonial, ceremonially wash. He's saying, actually, that's not how it works. How it works is this. What makes you unclean is the stuff that comes out of your heart. So in a context that we have today in society and in the world that says, follow your heart, Jesus says, you know what, best not to, because what comes out of your heart, you can't trust. Instead, that's just why we need to be born again. Don't trust the heart. Then he goes on to call a lady from, who's Syrophoenician, and isn't that a great word to say? Syrophoenician, it just rolls off the tongue. He calls her a dog. Now that sounds really harsh, you think, Jesus, why are you being so mean? And, but we have to understand this in the right context. The dog is not meant as an insult, it's meant to remind his listeners that there are two phases to Jesus' ministry. First phase, to the children of Israel, restoring all things in Israel, God's chosen people. Phase two, to the Gentiles, to those outside, the imagery of the, the, the dog. It's not meant to sound offensive to us, it really does. But that's what Jesus is saying. Then he goes goes on to heal someone who is deaf and mute. Then he feeds 4,000 people. And I know what you're thinking. Two minutes ago, Jesus, you were feeding 5,000. What's going on? Decreasing your power? Haven't, haven't had your Weetabix? Well, that's not what we're meant to get out of this. Instead, focus on the baskets that are left over. How many baskets were left over when there were 5,000 people fed? 12, representing the Israel nation. How many are left over this time? Seven. There's a slight change here to represent the gospel is going to all nations. This is a pivot moment in Jesus' ministry here. So he feeds uh, the 4,000. Then if you focus in on verse 14 of chapter 8, we get one of the few in-jokes in the whole of the gospel. And the in-joke is this. The disciples had forgotten to bring any bread except for the one loaf that they had with them in the boat. What was Jesus known as? The bread of life. Some commentators think this is Mark trying to be funny. We didn't bring any bread except bread of life himself, the one loaf who's in the boat. And I think it might be right here, actually. So this is, this is the bread of life that's in the boat with them. Uh, and then he warns that it's his disciples of the yeast of the Pharisees. In, in other words, something that's evil, that's really small, can impact something really big. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful. Then he heals someone again, and we get to where we are today. Slightly longer than a minute Forgive me, but there's loads in there. Uh, and what we're going to do today is get into what we might call the heavy stuff. Because we've journeyed through Mark some really, really exciting teaching from Jesus so far. And we've learned that all can be satisfied in Jesus Christ. And we would go yes and amen to that. We've learned that we can be healed and forgiven and set free, raised from the dead. Yes and amen to that. Last week, we heard from Adele that Jesus sees us, knows us, and answers us yes and amen to that. So let me just start by saying, on the one hand, with the gospel, with Jesus, there's absolutely no catch. He loves us. He loves us because he loves us, because that's who he is. Infinite patience, infinite goodness, infinite mercy. It sounds like there's a book coming. 
Well, there is, because we're called to follow him, and that's not easy. And we know it's not easy, because if you and I were honest with each other, and we turned to one another and asked the question, have you found it easy all your life following Jesus? I imagine most of us would go, no. There's been times we might be in the season right now where it's not easy to follow Jesus, so we know that. The other thing is the life and the work and the teaching of Jesus himself tells us it's not easy following Jesus. There's rejection, there's suffering, there's persecution, there's hatred. There is a cost to following Christ that we're going to unpack this morning. My hope and prayer as I've prepared this this week is that we would just ask the Holy Spirit just to come and apply what he wants to say to us in this. What does it look like? as we follow Jesus. I'm just going to break all this up into three chunks. And because I love play on words, as the team will just laugh now, because this is what I always do, we're going to look at this with with, uh, the the confession of Christ, the cost of following Christ, and the clarity of Christ. I know I was pleased as well that they all began with the same letter. Uh, The first is the confession. So if you just keep in front of you from verses um, verses 27 uh, to 30, we get this question from Jesus. Who do people say I am? Who do people say I am? Because the central truth of Christianity is not a set of moral guidelines to live by. It's not a philosophy to uh, say yes or no to. It centers on a person and who he is. This is a man who was standing in front of them who is meek and gentle and lowly and yet said he was the salvation of the world. This is a man who'd gone on his knees and washed his disciples' feet, and yet he said he would come again to judge the entire world. This is the man in front of them. Who is he? And the disciples uh, sum up what the talk of the town would have been at that time. All of these things would have been thereabouts in the hearsay. Some said he was the second John the Baptist. Others said that he was Elijah returning to prepare the way for the Messiah. Some people, other prophets, such as Jeremiah or maybe Isaiah, And these were great figures in uh, Israel's history, but comparing them to Jesus, though, wasn't enough. They fell short of who he was. So Jesus presses the question to his disciples themselves, but what about you? That's them. What about you? Who do you say that I am? Because these are the guys who've journeyed with him. As we have over the, the last couple of months, they've seen him walk on water. They've seen him still the sea. They've seen him feed 5,000, 4,000. They've seen him raise the dead. They've seen him heal the sick. They've seen him do all of this. Who do you say that I am? And at this moment, uh, we're faced with this question as well, but at this moment, you have this silence. And up steps Peter. Don't you just love Peter? Peter, the guy who cannot stand an awkward silence. Peter, the guy that would probably not stop singing and talking on a car journey. Peter, the guy who's always got something to say. Do you notice how most of us have heard, oh, I'm just like a Peter. We might say it ourselves or we've heard someone else say it. Very rarely you hear, I'm such a Paul. We hear, hear, I'm such a Peter. He's the guy who speaks without thinking, often puts his foot in it. And if you haven't thought that about yourself, someone's popped to mind who is a Peter, probably, in the last few seconds. He, He is this guy. And he speaks up, you are the Christ. And this is a wonderful moment because this isn't a foot-in-mouth moment for Peter. He absolutely hits the nail on the head, but he doesn't fully understand. In Matthew's version of this account, Jesus, responding to Peter, says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my Father in heaven. You haven't figured this out. God has revealed this to you that you're responding to. The great preacher C.H. Spurgeon said this in a sermon on these words, it's not only what Peter knew, but the way in which he came to know it, which made him blessed. He goes on to make the point that this is true of you too. If you are a Christian, the reason you believe, as you do, is because God, the Holy Spirit, has shown you, convinced you, and given you the gift of faith to see and lay hold of Jesus Christ. God has revealed Jesus to us that we respond to. And that's, that's how many of us uh, are here today. We've responded to that gospel. And often there are two ways that that happens. There's the instant getting it, trans- transformation, those testimonies where someone wasn't a follower and suddenly they are. And it might be that that is your testimony. That was, that was mine at the age of 15. I suddenly got that Jesus Christ is who he says he is, did love me, had died for me. I wanted to follow him. But for some of us, it's a long journey. And we might find ourselves this morning going, Do you know, I can't put my finger on when it was, but I know I'm there. 
And C.S. Lewis uh, described this brilliantly in the imagery of traveling in a car. He would say, actually, for some of us, if we're awake when we travel from one country to another, we know we've crossed the border. For some of us, we were asleep or were distracted. We're in the new country, but we don't remember when it happened. And it's a bit like that with, with, with our journey of faith. Both of them are valid and beautiful testimonies because it's about where we are now, not the moment we can remember. So he used that. And, and, and the question we are faced with today is, who do we say that Jesus is? It starts with a confession that he is the Christ. But then we go on to what the cost of that means from verses 31 to 33. The cost for Jesus primarily See, Jesus didn't primarily come to teach or to heal, but to save. And you notice in those words there, he uses the word must over and over again. He must do this. He must do this. It's not he might. It's not if he can get to it. He must do these things. There is no other way that we can be saved apart from Jesus Christ laying down his life. And this is the key teaching of the church and for 2,000 years, this has been attacked from within and without, uh, outside the church. But actually, we need to hold tight to the gospel that Jesus Christ came into the world to die. He spoke plainly. Verse 32, he spoke this plainly to them. And this was planned before the creation of the world. This is why Jesus came. But it's worth saying, Peter and the others would have been shocked at this. They were expecting a different kind of Messiah. This might be the first time they'd been faced with this truth that Jesus was going to give his life. And from verse 32, we look at Peter's reaction, and we might say, that's quite a normal reaction, actually. Whoa, 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 Jesus, take a breath. Have some breakfast. Think about what you're going to say before you say it. You might not want to do this. Well, I think, well, actually, that's a normal reaction. But Peter, if you look a bit closer, isn't saying, Jesus, if people are after you, run and hide. Or, Jesus, if people are after you, um, I'm really upset about that and I want to protect you. The word that's used is a rebuke. And a rebuke is another way of saying, you've got this wrong, Jesus. Or to put it even stronger, you're wrong, Jesus. Just picture the scene. Everything Jesus has journeyed through and been through, one of his disciples is looking him square in the eye and says, you're wrong. That's what's going on here. And even though he takes him to one side, Jesus needs to be so clear on why he's come and his mission, that he publicly rebukes Peter back and says, no, 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 no. You haven't got in mind the things of God, but the things of Satan. The conclusion you've come to is demonic. It is not not of God. That's that's a massive overreaction. The reason it's not is because Peter is echoing some of the things that we see in the temptation of Jesus in the desert, where Satan says, get get to this goal, but don't do it God's way. Do it the easy way. Do it the the way where where you can get power and fame. And Jesus says, no, I've come to lay down my life and serve. I will not cut corners. I will follow what God has given me. Jesus' sacrifice is why he came. If we deny that, we are denying the gospel. He had to die. And uh, wonderfully, in three weeks, we're going to be celebrating this front and center in our faith that Jesus came to give his life and and was raised victorious to give us new life. It's just such a wonderful gospel. We've sung about it this morning, and it moves me every time I kind of think about the cost of that. It cost him everything. And we have new life because he rose to new life. But if we're going to follow him as disciples, picking us up from verse 34, it means we follow him even to the cross. And this is where it gets a bit tricky. He says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. Have you ever used the phrase, this is the cross I bear? We hear it bandied around often, and it's used for things that might not actually be that heavy. Sometimes they are, don't get me wrong, but sometimes they're not. Maybe that that family member who turns up or whatever, it's the cross that I bear. And we almost minimize this because we make it about something that's unavoidable. But what Jesus is talking about here is something that's very avoidable. It's the choice to follow him to the cross or not. We very much have a choice in this. The sufferings that we face for his sake. And it really isn't a pretty picture. And he uses his language deliberately. He says, follow me, pick up your cross. Picture it lined up behind me. Jesus and women and men, crosses over their shoulder, ready to go 
and be humiliated, tortured, beaten, suffered, persecuted, all for the sake of Jesus, the dishonor. And several of his disciples we know from church history went the way of the cross literally. And Jesus is saying we must be ready to deny ourselves, maybe even our lives, for the gospel. Are we prepared to be rejected, despised, misunderstood, misrepresented, freedoms affected, even lives endangered? Because the bar of the kingdom of God is incredibly, incredibly low. It's receiving the finished work of Jesus on the cross. But the bar of discipleship is very, very high. It's pick up your cross, die to self, and follow him. Our brothers and sisters around the world know this better than us, I, I think. We support uh, an agency, a mission agency called Open Doors for persecuted Christians around the world. And many, this is the daily reality of suffering and persecution for the gospel. But for us, we must be reminded that true discipleship is not a private faith. It's not a private opinion. We must be outspoken and unashamed for Jesus. And he pleads with us, don't take that wide path. Don't take that way. Follow me. Don't compromise. So what does this look like for us, I wonder, in our everyday lives? It will be different for each of us. I've uh, heard many times that people struggle uh, with the Bible. And whenever I push back and go, well, what do you mean? Ordinarily, what they mean is there's bits of the Old Testament that sound horrible because God's in a bit of a mood. But the New Testament, because Jesus is lovely, is fine. And I often push back to go, well, for me, it's probably the other way around. The passages that scare me or challenge me the most are the words that come out of the mouth of Jesus. I find them the hardest. Read with me on verse 38. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. We might feel shame at times for following Christ faithfully in the world against the tide of culture, but that is nothing compared to the shame of hearing his call and ignoring it. That's nothing compared to that. What is the cost that all of us need to put to death? I feel I'm preaching to myself this morning, flipping out. Sorry. Um, so there's a confession of Christ, there's following Christ. But then there's the clarity. I wonder if, like me, you feel a bit wobbly here in some of this stuff. And I think deliberately we see where the, the scripture goes next. So this beautiful image of the transfiguration of Jesus. Because I think if I was Peter and the disciples and I'd heard, do you know what, I've got this wrong, I've been rebuked, and there's a cost and I'm going to have to die to self, I might need a little bit of a pick-me-up at this point. And I think sometimes that's a helpful way of seeing the transfiguration. You feel a bit wobbly, but then you see Jesus in his glory, which just tells you this is actually who he says he is. He, you can trust his words Verses 2 to 3, we see Jesus of chapter 9, Jesus full of dazzling white light. In the Old Testament, light is repeatedly associated with the holiness and the beauty of God. In the light of this call, this hard call, Jesus is saying, but you can trust me because I really am who I say I am, the Holy One. We see Moses and Elijah turn up. And Mark wants to tell us that there's something about the continuity of the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, with the New. Elijah representing the graces of the prophets, Moses, the law, that Jesus is going to fulfill both of them. That he's not just a new direction, he's the fulfillment of everything God was doing. And he appears in front of Moses and Elijah. I wonder at this point, do you ever think, I wonder what they talked about? There's certain moments in the Bible where I go, I would have loved to have known what they talked about. Did they turn up on time or was Jesus waiting? What, what, what did that scene look like? And I wonder, if you walked in on a conversation, what would you say? Well, we don't have to think about that because in steps Peter again, who says exactly what all of us would be thinking. Should we put some tents up? Should we establish new wine Middle East in, in the middle of here? No. I love Peter. He doesn't know what to say. In those situations, some of us will comfortably stay silent and wait for someone else. Not Peter. In we go. Let's get that tent up. Here we go. You know who you are. Anyway. Um, <laughs> but what this is a wonderful reminder here is this life, this mission we're called to is never mountaintop. Now, we need the mountaintop, but it's never mountaintop. It's never meant, we're never meant to stay there. That's why it's so amusing, Peter, saying, let's camp out. 
It was never a place to camp out. Our call is valley-based, because we, we want to stay there on the mountain. We, we hear those mountaintop experiences, and it might be that that's Sunday morning. It might be a great quiet time that you've had. It might be that conference you've been to, where we go, oh, and God was just so present there. And we're tempted to stay. We're never called to stay there, though. We're called to go back into the world. Our mission is to reach people, to be blessed, to be a blessing to reach with the gospel on our front lines, in our workplaces, in the valley. And this passage has one further affirmation for Jesus, but also for us. The beginning of his ministry after he's baptized, we hear this voice from the Father that says, this is my son whom I love, and we hear it again now, that actually as he's about to turn and face the cross and journey towards Jerusalem, we're reminded again, this is the son of God. This is the one we can listen to. This is the one that we can trust. We can listen to his voice and we can obey it. There is a confession, the cost, there is clarity. But finally, as I come into land, I just want to finish by um, reminding us, don't you notice that in life, actions often speak louder than words? If I was to ask you now, who has made an impact on your life? The chances are you won't be able to remember much of what they said, but you'll be able to remember what they did. Maybe it's time with you, maybe it's something that's impacted your life, good, maybe all bad. I don't remember the the conversation Luce and I had on our first date, but I do remember where we went, went, and I do remember laughing a lot. Um, But we're often impacted by actions more than words. I'm just going to illustrate what I mean by this. So just follow me if you you would. Put your hand out like this for me. There's a purpose to this. Make a circle like that, okay? And then put it on your chin. Why have you put it on your cheek? I said, put it on your chin. Actions speak much louder than words. And in this reading here, Jesus is talking about his sacrifice. And if it stopped at just words, it would have a limited impact. But he gave his life. He actually lived what he preached. He didn't just talk about the cross. He did it. And he calls us to do the same. Friends, the Christian life is all about radical love. It absolutely is. We talk about it most weeks, the love of of Christ. But friends, it's also about picking up the cross, denying yourself and following Jesus. And maybe we need to talk also about that a little bit more because that is the path that leads to life. Uh, I'm just going to finish with a quick story, if that's okay, before we pray. Um, This week I've been reading, uh, again, the, The Wonderful Life of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. And uh, a bit of a, a hero of mine, if you, if you know his story, he, he was a, a German uh, theologian, pastor around the time of Nazi Germany, and, uh, and was stood against the regime, and actually was in a plot to assassinate Hitler. And he was arrested, and he was uh, in, in a camp for a couple of years before eventually he was executed for standing against uh, the Nazis. And uh, wh- he died on the 9th of April, 1945, with six others. And I'd just like to to read this to you, if I can get through it, because it's absolutely not me for six this week. Um, The prison doctor, H. Fischer Holstrung, unaware of who Bonhoeffer was at the time of his death, years later reflected on how the prisoners were taken from their cells and the verdicts of the court-martial were read out to them. Through the half-open door in one room of the huts, he says, I saw Pastor Bonhoeffer before his death, taking off his prison garb, praying fervently to his God. I was most deeply moved by the way this lovable man prayed, so devout, so certain that God heard his prayer. He went on. At the place of execution, he again said a prayer, climbed the steps of the gallows, brave and composed. His death ensued in a few seconds. In the almost 50 years that I have worked as a doctor, I have hardly seen a man die so entirely submissively to the will of God. One half his last recorded words were spoken to a captured British agent, Payne Best. He said, this is the end for me the beginning of life. Friends, whoever loses their life for the sake of the gospel will save it. Or remembering this morning the sacrifice of Jesus as we come to his table, receive bread and wine. And it seems that's the right way to respond. But it might be that God wants to minister to you in his word this morning. And there's a couple of ways that we're going to do this. Um, If Jesus has challenged you, you may simply wish to acknowledge that where where you're sat. But as we come for bread and wine, if you feel there's something God's calling you into deeper water with, I wonder just, just as you receive bread and wine, just pray a simple prayer. 
Lord, forgive me and lead me, just as we turn again to pick up our own cross. We actually have made some crosses over here that you might want to take to pop in your Bible and on your, your desk this week. It's just as a simple scripture, just to reflect. And we also have prayer ministry team available who, if you want to pray or process this with anyone. But this morning, as we think about the cost of following Jesus, we go because he first went there. He gave his life for us and calls us to respond with him. Let's pray together.